have your Bibles, please open with me. We had mentioned at the beginning of this Julian year that we'll take the whole month to, to set the, the frame or the rudder, the keel of the ship. And in, in Matthew chapter 4, please grace that particular scripture, which happens to be the theme, our annual theme as a fellowship. Matthew chapter 4, specifically in verse 19, uh, this sets the stage for the entire year. And again, our exhortation to the body, to the believers is you know, our, the best Revo uh, I've gotten so used to saying revolution instead of the best resolution. The best revolution idea though for those who are somewhat straining for a New Year's resolution, the best ever is just to know God more and to make Him known. Amen? Know God. Just know God more. Reveal to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Get to grow in prayer. Grow in evangelism. Grow in intercession. Grow in your hospitality. Go through your closets. The clothes that you haven't worn in seven years, trust me, you'll never wear it again. So grow in your ability to just whatever is there that's unused when you drive by and you see the homeless people gathered around. You know exactly where they are in your states. Tell them, hey, God loves you. Here's a blanket. Here's something. Love is a verb, and a verb is an action word, and so please act it out. If there's no action that backs up the profession of love, then it's just infatuation or it's just fallen currency. So uh, be aware to reach out, and, 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 and let's not get so disconnected. We're in trying times. We're in burdensome times, disconcerting even, but all the more relevant for the church the church, the people of God. We've got to be prayerful. We've got to have the compassion of Jesus. And let's reach across the political lines and all the other stuff. They really, in the Hawaiian word, manini. Yeah, but uh, stand for righteousness. You are salt. You are light. Make a difference every day. Get to know God and make him known. Verse 19 of Matthew chapter 4. Uh, pick up in verse 18, Jesus, Yeshua, in the Hebrew, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Cephas in the Greek, or Kepha in the Hebrew, and Andrew, or Andrew, his brother, Andrew actually went towards, he took the gospel there towards the Armenian side of the world, the Slovak side of the world as well, and that's why a lot of the Armenians and the uh, people in Moldova and and uh, Bucharesti, there in modern in Romania, there they they have names. Andrew is a prolific name in the region, in honor of the apostle. Kind of the same way here, uh, in the U.S., the most common baby name for a male child is Joshua, um, and in the in that part of the world it's Andrew. So Simon called Kepha and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Read verse 19 with me. Then he said to them, follow me. Remember this. Follow me. And the what's the effects of following Jesus? Say it. And I will make you fishers of men. That as we set our eyes on the Redeemer, the only true Savior, the only name given whereby man can be saved, when we set our eyes and our affections and we surrender our allegiance to Him, something magnanimous happens. He gives us His heart for the lost. Mother Teresa said, it's impossible to, to love God and not have a love for the Jews. Some people say, uh, it's impossible to love God or profess to love God and, and, and not have a love for people. That's the whole mission charter, the reason why Jesus came, to seek and save the lost. And we were all lost. We had all sinned. All have, have had fallen short, have fallen short of the glory of God. Regardless what continent you're from, what country you're in, what languages you speak, or what currency, or what borders, or whatever. Wherever you're from, every earthling has fallen short of the highest that God has for us. And so Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah from the house of David, Christ came out on His heavenly errand, his sole mission being to seek and save those who are lost. And so, but the, the amazing thing here is he says, follow me, say it. Follow me. If you set me as the 
the center of your all, that I will in turn do something so glorious in you, no human being, no denomination, no, no, no ethnic you know, cluster can actually do this on a permanent basis, eternal even. No one can claim this. He says, if you follow me, I will make you fishes of men. And, and better phrase this way, if I were to take two theological words, following Jesus or, or ensuring that he has our allegiance and he is the apex of it all, that's worship. Say worship. When you worship the king of kings in the superlative, the lord of lords, the kurios in the Greek, when you set him as the, not just the number one, but the only one, he does something in us. He gives us a heart for people. Whether they agree with you or not is irrelevant. The heart of Jesus yearns for relationship with people because in relationship, therein, hidden, is the very nugget of his, of his errand, of his mission charter. He came to seek and save the lost. And that meant he, not, he understood he was coming to die for humanity. Blood in, blood out is the language that's notorious in the draconian and barbary. Uh, barbaric world of the gangs. You have to blood in. The final in initiation to joining a gang is they beat you. You, you kind of are tossed into this gauntlet and they surround you and they beat you. You have to bleed out. And then they say that's a baptism of fire. Once in the gang, always a gang. Blood in, blood out. Well, listen, we were all blood in because we were all in the genes, all in the DNA of Adam. And so we inherited this thing called sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We've all sinned. But Christ has come and He has died for us. becoming, uh, to, Receiving unto Himself the recompense, the wrath that was due to humanity. He comes in as the embodiment of mercy and says, I love you all, red, white, yellow, brown, and white. Jesus loves the little children, brown, black, and white, and all the other colors. He says, I love you all. I'm going to die for you all. And you all, when you were born, you inherited, you had hung over your head this death penalty that you incurred from your parents. It's in you. But guess what? Though Adam was a natural being, Christ is a life-giving spirit. I've come to die your death. And when you trust in me, my life oozes in you. And you make a difference here in this world and you will register in the world to come. Are you there? That's called the born-again experience. Give the Lord a hand, would you please? And so something glorious about this Christ, as we surrender to Him, a lot of us who cut our teeth in religion, cut our teeth in all kinds of stuff. Apparently, two millenniums ago, the Godhead in heaven looked upon the earth and says, your religion isn't good enough. Your spirituality isn't good enough. Because if it was good, if it was kosher, Christ was on a fool's errand. But Christ came because God saw religion, saw our man-made entrapments and our spiritual catastatics. And, and God says, it's not good enough. I'm sending my son to actually hold your hand and bring you over. And so Christ is the, the one that upon the cross on Golgotha breaches this, this chasm between fallen humanity, mere mortals. He transforms us by his glory, takes mere mortals who have surrendered to him and makes us saints. By, his, his, by his, his propitiation, he imputes upon us this glorious thing called righteousness. What is that imputed righteousness? He says, if you surrender to me, when my father looks at you, he doesn't see your bad works. He doesn't see all the stuff that we thought we got away with. He sees the completed work of moi, French for you, me. He sees my completed work in you and God. And my father says, adjudicated, mitigated, Christ has done this. And he has become our advocate. And it's an amazing thing. He takes mere fallen, mere mortals. And when we surrender to him, we become this trophies. Not that we're perfect. No one is except him. But we become blameless because we've been forgiven. And so now Christ uses us in the world and says, Now be over there because your, your siblings and those that you grew up with, know, they know who you were. But now they're going to see someone new because it's in me living in you by my spirit. And they're going to ask you questions like, how did you change? What happened to you? That's the, that, 
that that addiction had the had the best part of your life or whatever it was and they see transformation you used to be a racist you used to be a punk you used to be a whatever it is but now you're you're different you're something about you and it's not us it's Christ in us we are told in scripture 2 Corinthians 5:17 if anyone is in Christ behold he's a new creation all things have passed away and all things have become new only Christ can change and transform us and create in us the person that we were meant to be to bring Him praise and bring Him glory. Only Christ. And so He says, worship. Follow me. Jesus has got to be the center of everything. Worship leader, hear this. Church leaders, hear this. Church pastors, hear this. If Christ isn't the center of everything, it's not a church. If in your, in your worship songs you don't mention the name of Jesus in your repertoire, something is off. You need to mention his name because that's the only name that not just demons tremble at, but that's the only name that saves. Give the Lord a hand, would you please? The name of Jesus. Follow me. Worship me. The correlation, the relationship between worship and evangelism, what we refer to as missions. When you know God, you will have the heart of God for people, family members or otherwise, local or translocal. You will have a heart for them. That's what scripture says. That's why Jesus came. Follow me, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. Well, now we have a problem. Here's a conundrum for you. Pastor Easy, and I've heard this throughout the years, every now and then. I love God, but I just don't have. I love Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew. I love him, but I just don't have a heart for people. That's impossible. That, my friend, is as impossible as the impossibilities of one fine day in the middle of the night. Two dead men got up to fight. Three blind men went to see the fair play, and four dumb men cried hooray. Two dead donkeys came galloping by, kicked the blind man in the eye, leaped over a garden wall into a dry ditch, and drowned them all. That's about as impossible as that. <laughs> if you say you love Jesus and you don't have a love for people, one or two things. You're following the wrong Jesus or you're just not born again. You have religion, but you don't have relationship. And both accounts, they need to be arrested with repentance. Are you there? They need to be arrested with repentance. All right? You cannot. It's impossible to say you love God and not have a love for people. It's impossible. It doesn't mean that you'll agree with them. It doesn't mean that you can cross your T's and dot, dot your I's. No, no, no. And sometimes you'll, you'll bump into such people. But it's impossible. Husbands, you cannot say you love God and you are mistreating your wives. Wives, it's impossible to say you love God and you are not respecting your, your husband. Whether they're believers or not is irrelevant. You're in the marriage now moving forward. The wisdom of God yeah, chides us to be equally yoked. So those of you singles, be equally yoked. If you're single or not, praise God. And you want to get married one day, praise God. The Bible opens you the marriage and closes with the marriage. However, let's get these things straight. Be equally yoked. It says do not be unequally yoked. So what does equal yoking mean? Make sure that the person that you're having a, the, uh, there's a commitment towards long-term marriage, they're born again, number one. In this day and age, you have to qualify Christianity now. Because many so-called Christians are, acting like non-Christians. You have to qualify. They have to be born again, blood-bought, spirit-filled, and they've got to be walking in holiness. Uh, somebody said amen. amen. You cannot, you cannot say you're a Christian and you're cussing like a sailor and you're in your online gambling or all the other filth. It's impossible. You, either you're salt or you've lost your saltiness. Jesus said, salt having lost its flavor needs to be tossed out and trembled for, in the words of Jesus, it is good for nothing. Very simple, isn't it? We just complicate the matter. And so those of you who are singles, let me give you a parameter as to those to be praying for. Number one, they've got to be truly born again. Walk the walk. All right. Number two, here's, all right, and they've got to have a passion for the Lord just like you towards fulfilling, the, fulfilling what we refer to as a great commission. They've got to want to leave for the Lord. Right? They've got to have an eternal perspective. Now here's, who you can rule out for those of you praying for the mates. And it's fine to pray for mates. The Lord makes all things beautiful in his time. Here's who not to look for. And here's who 
falls under the unequal yoking or the wrong category. Understand this, that your spouse isn't right now someone who's married. Somebody said amen. amen. All right, ladies, your husband isn't someone else's current husband. Your husband-to-be. Wives, the same thing matters. It is not someone of the same sex. It's not someone who, who is currently married. It's not someone who's a non-believer. So you really got to put some, hey, buddy, how are you, Ezra? Are you, are you just kind of hanging out, dude? Dude, we love you, man. Ezra James, would the parent of this child please come and retrieve him, or else we will turn him over to the circus? <laughs> he just came to visit. Worship. In worshiping the Lord, you have his heart. We say this, you say in the West, we grew up with this back down under. Birds of the same feather flock together. That's either good or bad, but they flock together. Okay. Your constant circle of influence and proximity to somebody will actually result in habits being passed. You will pick up habits. From those that you hang out with. They could be good habits or bad habits. But you'll pick up something from them. The same is true with God. When you hang out with God. You'll get to have God's heart. Follow me. And I will make you. And I will give you my heart for the lost. Somebody said amen. That's our mission charter. I got a few testimonies coming up. I'm reminded of an illustration. Where a German soldier who was wounded was asked by his mom to show up at the hospital. And as he showed up, this magnificent building, with almost an architectural wonder. And uh, he, he looks at this. He heard music, but apparently people were in the auditorium someplace. And as he walks in through this great building, he w into the, the main uh, you know, office hall, greeting, welcome center, whatever. As he walks in, uh, he looks out, and there were two doors, and the doors had labels over them. And the, the label said, and each door led to a different path, someplace in the building. The label said, uh, if you are injured, uh, you're seriously injured or just slightly injured, critical or just slightly. He says, uh, slightly, I'm slightly injured. So he pushes the slightly injured door, and lo and behold, there's a great hallway standing, staring in front staring at him right there. So he says, okay, I'm going to walk this thing. So he walks, and he walks on this hallway. And when he comes to the end, lo and behold, there's two other doors. And the door says, in need of assistance, or you can continue to walk on your own in assistance. And there was a, a whole rack of wheelchairs. Apparently, you had to wheel yourself or the other. He says, I, I can pretty much walk. I just came down the hallway. So he pushed the double doors, and off he went into this another great hall. And as he's walking in this hall, he's doing pretty good, you know. Uh, by the time he reaches the end, and the two doors again, and the door said, the labeled commissioned officer or non-commissioned officer. And he says, I'm a non-commissioned officer. I'll take that door. So he walks down another hallway. And as he's walking down this hallway, he's thinking, man, I'm losing weight as I'm walking. You know, I need to cancel my Pilates, uh, yeah, uh, whatever, curves and all the other fun stuff. So as he's walking, there's a door right there that says enter. And as soon as he pushes the door open, bam, he's out in the middle of the street. He goes, now how did that happen? So he shows up at home, and of course his mom was there to greet him. And the mom says, Wolfgang, welcome home. And he says, Danke, Mate. And, uh, and she says, well, uh, how did it go? Did they help you? And this is Wolfgang's confession. He says, uh, they didn't help me one bit. They did absolutely nothing to me. Oh, but matter, the building is beautiful and they have good organization skills. <laughs> and I fear that all too often, churches have become that way. We are more concerned about the building and the organization, and we've forgotten. We say we love Jesus, but we don't have a heart for the loss. And all we are in praise and worship in the main auditorium, loving this God who gave himself for all at cost to himself, but no one's hitting the streets. No one's been told to evangelize and share the bread of life. 
We got all these hallways. We got good organizational skills. But no one's being taught to have compassion. You are here in this equipping session to be confronted, every one of us not examined by the Spirit of God, so that when we do leave, I'd like to have a sign that says the church has left the building. And the two Hawaiian words, gone fishing. That would be appropriate because we're still stuck on our Sunday grid. And we hear a good message and it's moving. But from Sunday sunset, the truth has been robbed from our lives. And wherever we work in the various spheres of society, law enforcement, education, science, government, family, uh, every you know, first responders, whatever field you're from, we aren't being taught that we are there because people there need the Lord. And we aren't being challenged to pray for your workers, to pray for your bosses, fast a meal for their children, information that you hear in the lunch hall, they're at the brink of divorce. They're at the brink of something. Someone needs to go to rehab. We hear the information, but we are not wise enough to convert information into points of intercession. We aren't. And we need to engage the world. Need I remind you that the word church in the Bible never refers to a physical building, but always the people of God who've surrendered to Christ. You are the church. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you've surrendered to Christ, you are His hands. You are His feet. By your lifestyle, God didn't call us to fit in. He called us to be holy. By your lifestyle, at your job site, at your marriages, hopefully it creates a thirst in the hearts and minds of people that will cause them to say, what is it about you? Are we praying for our co-workers? Are we praying for those of you business owners, entrepreneurs, and creative geniuses? Are you praying for? Do we set time aside to pray for those who are under us, those who are laterally with us, those who are over us? Not just in the government, but in the workforce as well. They need the Lord. And when we follow God, we follow Christ, He makes us fishes of men. You will be concerned about those around you. And yes, I feel so limited. I can't do much. It's fine. But I'm there on site with inside. I can call out to the one who can do something. I will fast and pray for these guys. I will pray for that family. I will pray for my managers. They're going through hard times. There is no problem that is too big for our Savior. If he was glorious enough to die and shoulder the sins of humanity and rise again on the third day, how big you think your drama is or their dramas are? Nothing. It's just not even a grain of sand in the cup of eternity. But it's got to take someone that has prophetic insight to say, I'm going to pray for them. I need to pray for them. So may you be more prayerful this year. May we be more gregarious in our mission charter to know God and to make Him known, to follow Jesus and to have a heart to share His amazing love with people. What's the gospel? The gospel is pretty much this. Turn with me, please, very fast before I invite these guys to have some testimonies here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As you turn there, say it. Worship and missions. Say it. Go hand in hand. The God that I worship, the only true God. He, he loves people. And so as I worship Him, He... He activates this G John 3.16 missions DNA in me to want to share something, to want to share the love of God, to want to share the gospel. Here are the three points to what the components are to the genuine gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, just cut right in. For I delivered to you, first of all, Paul talking to the saints in Corinth, that which I also received. You cannot give what you don't have. That, say it with me, Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, number one. Okay? Number two, that He was buried. And thirdly, that He rose again the third day according to Scriptures. That's it. The gospel must encapsulate those three things. 
Number one, Christ came and he died for us. He died for all humanity. Secondly, after having been crucified, he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again and lives forevermore. Somebody said amen. And so that's the beauty of the gospel. Anything shy of this is just another gospel. Because now you're confronted with why did Christ come? He came to die. Why did he have to die? It seems so puny. It seems so, such a waste. It seems so he had to die because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Blood in, blood out. He had to pour out his blood for us. And when you come surrender to him, you're under his blood. There's life forevermore. Amen. What an awesome reality. We have opportunities. You'll see it there in your bulletin. We have opportunities for evangelism all around us. Evangelism is just taking the opportunity to share the gospel with people. And, uh, you know, lunch break, during your lunch break, don't preach while you are on the clock unless the owner of the clock happens to be your boss and he says, come into my office and preach to me. It opens up the door. Then take your liberty in Christ. But other than that, don't preach. You are paid you agreed on a set amount of time to get a certain job done and the business is around it. So conduct your father's business in the language of the New Testament, the language of Jesus and the Hebraic. Go about your Christian work witnessing through your lifestyle how you live. And during lunch breaks, when you are given time off the clock as a good steward, hopefully people are thirsty enough, you can share with them in your lunch break. But it's going to cause people to, to, to thirst about this Savior, about this gospel, about this God that you know through Christ, it'll create a thirst in them when they see how you walk and how you live your life. They'll see it. And they'll go, what is it about you? I want to know more about this thing. Oh, it's not religion, buddy. It's relationship. Talk to me more about this. I'd like to. But you know what? Let's meet at lunch. Unless it's the boss who's actually talking to you, then he's giving you leeway on his clock to share the gospel. Well, you've got to walk this thing through with wisdom. But your life, more powerful than any sermon is a Christian that's walking the walk. Somebody said amen. amen. Live it. Just live it. Just live it. Walk it out. And that creates a, a thirst. We have opportunities on the first Tuesdays of every month. If you look into your bulletin, you'll see it. The first Tuesdays of every month, we head out and minister to the families there at Shriners Children's Hospital. Coming in from the Pacific, people have given their lives to Christ. They're Methodist, religion, nominal, some Hindus and Muslims, not just from Fiji, but from Samoa, New Zealand as well, uh, from the Tahitis and the Cook Islands. And so we reach out every first Tuesdays, every second Fridays. And the first, uh, 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 you know, after our Isaiah 58 fast, every second Friday, we head out. Pastor Greg takes the crew out, whoever's able. I want to encourage you today. As you know Jesus, let him give you a heart that will cause us to be fishers of men. Come on out. There's a lot of opportunities here available in the fellowship to go out evangelism. We'll hear some testimony after this. On the fourth Saturdays of months that have five Saturdays, on the fourth Saturdays, we drive up. Kirk mentioned it. If you can help out, you, wanna, you have a big vehicle, you want to meet us at the Shriners right there by the uh, Punahou, uh, we'll just... Whoever wants to come at the hospital, they'll jump on in. We'll bring them over here, serve them lunch, have them just relax, get them off hospital grounds. They can walk around, give the, the uh, parents a break. They can take a swim, take a dip in there because they're always the guardians of these kids, late, uh, late hours of the night. So we've got to take care of them. And then in the afternoon, we head them back. Here. We take them back to the uh, uh, hospital grounds. And so if you want to help out in that, let us know. You want to help you shuttle people back and forth, or you want to help make lunch and have a big lunch here for them we're just catering we're saying here we are this is the love of jesus for you come on in and we've had great times of prayer even sharing evangelism as well so that that happens on this particular saturday coming up here are our three new rollouts greg get ready here are some new rollouts that, that's coming i want you to be aware of beginning on february instead of just having jc night we're having gen x night gen x the next generation Right, that's going to be on the uh, third Fridays. We're going to have praise and worship. Bring the instruments out, praise and worship, and then some of the Gen X guys will share the word. Then we get to pray J Gen X and JC. Then we'll have a good uh, hallelujah time. You know, sharing uh, dinner and bring your roller blades and all the stuff. But we are having it out in the community as an evangelistic outlet. Uh, so be 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 looking out for that. The other thing that's coming out on the month of March is on the third Sunday. Say third Sundays. Every third Sunday is launching in March. 
Uh, now, on the first Sundays, we head out to the nursing home right here in Kapolei. Whoever comes out, headed out by Kirk. On the third Sundays, we'll be cooking food. We will have prepped that morning, and as soon as service is done, we head over to the Kapolei Park across from the library. We're picking up this initiative again. We're going to be eating with the homeless people. There's a lot of homeless people who are showing up here again, so we want to take food out there, not just feed them, but eat with them. Praise and worship, share testimonies, pray with them. Why, why are we launching this in March? Here's why. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Gives you time, two full months, to, if you have uh, backpacks, you have backpacks, you know, there at home, pick some up in Salvation Army. We want to begin to prepare backpacks and put Ziploc bags in there, very transparent with the, with the, you know, granola bars and first aid kits and flashlights and a few batteries and hand wipes and, and just has some, some practical stuff for the homeless people. So when we start this on March, whatever practical needs they have, we hand them a backpack that has some of these needs in there. Are you there? And then every time we come back on the third Sundays, they'll have clothes there for themselves. You'd want to take clothes, whatever. But we don't want to just give it out to them. You can accomplish that with philanthropy. We want to be there to share the gospel with them. And we've done this before, so we're picking up again. Be praying for that. It's not just feeding the homeless. It's ministry to the homeless. We're going to be eating with them. I want to make some of my curry and some chowder and some Persian stuff. And so uh, some of you vegans, you may want to be fasting when we do that. Um, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm saying it for the homeless people's sake because apparently some of them need protein. I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm fine, but if they need meat, I'll give them steaks. So anyways, I'm just a little moment of parody there. Um, on the last Sundays of each month, we've already launched this, and it's happening here. Last Sundays of each month is Communion Sunday. Get to know the Lord and get to know his heart for us. And on the last Sundays also at 5 p.m., we're having praise and worship down at uh, the Fourth Lagoon. Instruments, just acoustic, bring your beach chairs, bring your lauhala mat from five to six, one hour. We'll just get up there, praise and prayer, and spend some time fellowshipping under the sun, so be aware. Anyways, those are some of our outlets coming up, and we appreciate your prayers and everything else. Greg, come up here and share some testimony. Now, Greg took some of the, gr the, uh, the crew out on our evangelistic night and shared the gospel. They got some testimonies. Come on up, brother. Adam, where you at, buddy? Where's Adam? Come on up here for a moment. So um, Adam has a testimony as well. So we go out uh, once a week and we share the gospel. And uh, it, it's an amazing opportunity to, to do so. And Adam had an opportunity to come out for, was it your first time, right? Coming on out with us there to do that. And so I like, I think it's always fun to hear somebody's perspective who's never gone out and shared the gospel before what was that like for you what what, what did you see and how did he participate and so adam want to share that with us here buddy come on up and by the way give a shout out to your family there where's your parents at you guys give them a hand all the way from where new york awesome great to have you guys okay thanks um so yeah my first time and uh, i didn't really know what to expect i was kind of expecting a lot of just in general, is it, am I too? Nice job. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a lot of kind of rejection and um, mockery. And it was really incredible to me how many people are out there that actually were open to hearing the word and um, like letting us share with them. And I, I, we were, I mean, I think we were unusually successful, kind of <laughs> average, or I, I don't know. But, um, you know, even if we weren't, that successful, it still would have been an awesome experience because you know one if, if you affect one person's um, relationship with God, that's that's um, that's something, right? That's that's a pretty incredible thing. Um, and I was more just there for prayer support. I kind of just watched, um, but it was really um, something that stuck with me, and I've been thinking about it for the last two weeks now, basically. Um, and I would just encourage everyone who, if they haven't experienced that, to try it because it's it's um, it's important. And there's so many people out there who who really do need to hear the word. So. Adam, thanks for that, man. Really appreciate it. And 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 like Adam said, it is so many people out there need to hear the word. We we what we find is that there's so many folks that that they have this deep sense of they want to be loved. They want to have a sense of community, connection, 
They want to know that they belong someplace. And there's only one way that anybody could be fully fulfilled in that, and that's through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to that. And so what th- part of my testimony I'm going to share today is how do, we, how do we get there, right? How do we get to that point where we can actually enter into that conversation? And as weeks go by, I'm going to share a bit more on this, uh, but, a, but a testimony. And I draw from, from 1 Corinthians 9.19 with how, how we approach this. So if, if, if you could turn there and or write, write this down. For, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without law, as without the law, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker with you. My wife and I, went out um, uh, uh, to eat a couple of weeks ago. And this is a practical thing that, how do you share the gospel um, uh, in, in ways that you can go in restaurants and in, in various situations of how you can actually share the gospel with people. And there's with street evangelism, that's something that we do. Uh, uh, and, and I approach that differently than when I'm in a restaurant. So we had this uh, young lady in the restaurant is just, going nuts just a ton of people out there my wife and I on our date night just hanging out and it was a great time and and this young lady came up and she's just so chipper and nice and asked us what we wanted and we ordered a whole lot of amazing food that's another conversation but as we're ordering this food um, I asked her I said you know when we when we receive our food one of the things that my wife and I like to do is we like to thank the Lord for this food and while we're doing that is there anything that we can pray for you about. Is there any needs you maybe have at home? Anything. And as we did that, this young lady just went, and her eye, and she went from business mode, I'm gonna make something happen, to just her eyes stop. And she looks at us and she looks around. And you can see her processing. Can I really trust these guys? Can I can I really share with them what's what's actually going on? And you watched her. She just stepped forward and she says, yes, you, you can pray for me. I'm, I'm going through a really tough time at home. And as she started to, she started to share what was happening at home. And her husband once knew the Lord and he had backslidden and he had walked away. She has a brand new baby that was just born a couple months. And she has a two-year-old. And her husband has gone AWOL. We had no idea. We're just out there having an amazing meal. And this lady, and she starts to cry. And as we asked her, can we pray for you? She even allowed us to actually right there in the restaurant pray for her. And the Lord blessed her and touched her, and she wept. It was just such an amazing thing. And she's sitting there just drying off the tears of her eyes, you know, like looking around if anybody could see. And she was so blessed. It was such an amazing thing. And it's a reminder for us is that when you go out to restaurants and when you're making these connections with people, remember, people, they want a sense of belonging. They may look like they've got it all going on. And this lady looked that way. She was amazing at her job. But the moment that opportunity came up and she trusted us for that moment, and God just touched her in a way that, is absolutely a phenomenal thing as we got to pray for her and now we're continuing to pray for her and we have her number and we're building that dialogue that relationship with her and it's such a blessing for us to be able to do that and one of the last things I want to share about it as well is when we are there and if you're gonna write a scripture down if you're gonna share the gospel with somebody please leave a ginormous tip I've heard some Christians go, you know what, I just gave them the most powerful, worthy thing they could ever have in their life, and yes, you did. But 
but bless them. Bless them in other ways. These are practical ways that people who don't know the Lord might go like, wow, there's something different about those guys. What is it about them? We want to love people in such a way that it creates such a hunger in their hearts and a curiosity that they're going to want to know who is that God? Who is that Jesus? Who is it? I want to know that God. And that's how God has created you. That's why you have this amazing gift and this present that's been given to you. Pull it out from under the bed, unwrap that thing, and start sharing that thing wherever you go and whatever circumstance you have. Take your wife out to dinner this week and give it a shot. You might not get the response I have, but you'll get a response. <laughs> you know, you'll get a response, but pray for them anyway. They might look at you like you're a nut job. Most of the time we get that, right? A lot of no thank yous, that's fine, right? We pray for them anyway. But every once in a while you'll have that opportunity and God will just bless them. But my wife and I walked out of there so much more blessed than this young lady. So. I want to encourage you all to go for it like Adam did there. And please join us when we go out to share the gospel on, uh, on, on Fridays. And you'll see it there on your bulletin. It is such a blessing when people are walking down the street and you're seeing folks. And we go to the mall and in different ways of just starting relationships and connections with people as they're walking by. Maybe if they've gone to a movie like Star Wars, you know, you can start this amazing conversation, right? So, uh, uh, is it, do you, what do they have? The, the I haven't even seen the new Star Wars. What am I saying? <laughs> but if you do, the light and dark side, right? Do you guys believe in the light side and the dark side? And they'll, like, start a conversation with you. That's an entranceway right into the gospel. It's amazing. And the last thing I want to share is that we had this group of, uh, I don't know, seven or eight ladies or so when Adam was out with us. And they were walking by, and they just saw this really scary movie. And so we got to share with them. It's, it's, it was a pretty intense movie, and we said, imagine that fear never ending. And they're like, that's what life's like in eternity without God. It's just an awful, awful thing. And they're looking at us, and they're just taking us seriously. And some of the girls are like, hee hee, joking around, having fun. But there's these three or four girls that are just dialed in. And as we shared the gospel with them, these two girls, especially this one, just started weeping. And her friend comes out from Jamba Juice going, are you crying? And she, like, goes, we're learning about Jesus. Come here. And she goes, oh, I don't want anything to do with that, right? So she goes back in. But there's this impact. And people are walking by in the mall going, what's going on over there? This curiosity takes place. I don't know, four or five or so of them gave their life to the Lord right there on the spot. Because God, God blessed them. God touched them. And it's such an incredible thing. So, again, come on out and, and, and join us and learn like Adam did and pray with us. Uh, and, and we'll give you all sorts of amazing things that you can do to low to learn and grow in this thing because our job as we're saying this year come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men but come on out follow us and we will make you fishers of men that's our goal that's our job and we are an equipping center and we want to do that for you you guys are a blessing thanks thank you thank you let's open to our closing scripture today and let's all stand to our feet closing scripture Thank you, Lord. Turn with me to what's known as the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Share the bread of life. Hey. Say it with me. S share the bread of life. Evangelism is just a fanciful word for, for former or previous beggars sharing with current beggars where the bread of life is. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Read with me. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, Matthew 28, verse 19 now. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name or the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the triune Elohim, teaching them, instructing them, to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
He's called us to make a difference. He's called us to share. Share the message with aloha. Here are seven powerful words for you. Aloha, how can I pray for you? Very simple, right? Aloha, how can we pray for you? And see what happens. Oh, boy. Let's just go ahead and bow our, our, our heads and contemplate this. And, Lord, would you give us your heart? There's a story of a, of a great fisherman from Minnesota. He was well known. He knew how to fish. He had everything. Everything every good fisherman needed. Poles and nets and bait and these amazing boat and he even graced the pages of magazines, the fishing magazines, and he's given talks, conference call, uh, he's speaking in the union. Uh, but there was something really weird about this guy. The weird thing is he had never caught any fish up till that point in his life. And you go, wait, how can an expert who does all this stuff and has all these things not catch any fish well simply he was well equipped but he had never gone out fishing that's why he hadn't caught any fish he had all the goods all the stuff had the appearance of a fisherman but he never caught any fish because he simply didn't go out and do it this year as we know God as we follow Jesus let's trust him to give us his heart for souls so we can get up there and share. The Spirit of God will help us. Let's not be like this guy from Minnesota who had the knowledge. He had the boat and had everything. Let's make a commitment today. Spirit of God, I will leave the docks today to go out fishing. Somebody said amen. So Father, help us. We thank you for the helper, the Paracletos. Holy Ghost, help us for the glory of Jesus. As we grow deeper in worship and in understanding the word, give us a great heart for the lost. Right here, locally, across the street, to pray for them. Everything begins with prayer. Begin to pray. Oh, Lord, if that's your heart to the, today, just go ahead and say it out loud. Lord, give me your heart. Give me your heart for the broken, your heart for the lost. Let me see with your eyes and fill with your heart and let me extend. It's, it's going to cost us something. It, it will cost us time to pray. It will cost us giving of things. But listen, folks, for the glory of Jesus, we've laid our lives down. Our lives have been forfeited. It's no longer us that lives, but Christ that lives in us. Amen? So, Father, strengthen your church today. We thank you for your passion for the lost. We thank you for your passion for the lost who are saved, that they be mentored and equipped and discipled. Thank you for your amazing love. Receive your praises, O oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Now for the benediction, let's raise our hands together. If you are here today, you've never been water baptized. You're a, you're a born again believer, but you've never been water baptized. Come and talk to us. The waves are crushing. They're crashing on the rocks and they're just saying, come to me, we'll do the job. Here we go for the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his Shekinah glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. The church has left the building. Go and do the will of God.